Today we're going to be discussing 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 3, how this verse, how this simple verse can help us know of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. As always, the opinions expressed in this video are my own personal opinions and not that of the church or any of its leaders. Let's start off by reading it, 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 3, and I know that the record which I make is true, and I make it with my own hand, and I make it according to my knowledge. How can this help us increase our testimony of the Book of Mormon? I will tell you. Um, it's something called a colophon. A colophon is an ancient and modern literary device that gives the reader information about the authorship and publisher of any text. Anciently, it was used in a lot of Asian writings. A lot of colophons were found in writings from ancient Tibet and a lot from not only Israel, but Egypt, maybe more specifically. A lot, a lot of Egyptian writings, especially those dealing with the pharaohs, were written with this colophon. The colophon anciently was a statement at the end, or a lot of times at the beginning of a book, which gave information to the reader about what the book was about, the author of the book, who wrote the book, when the book was written, the information that we see a lot of times on a modern day title page. Um, the word colophon now is used to refer to the emblem put on the book by the publisher, uh, but anciently the colophon was used almost as an indexing tool so people could look through a scroll really quickly or look through a stack of, of parchment and figure out what it is that they, or see what they were looking for really quickly just by scanning the beginning or end of the document. So like I said, the history of the colophon has kind of migrated. Anciently, it was used in many, many different texts. Uh, we even see it used in the book of Genesis and the book of Numbers. It's used in a variety of different books in the Book of Mormon, and we'll get to that. Um, but just know, you know, anciently, as far back as 2000 BC, we see writings with the colophon in it. It is a very standard uh, literary tool that helped readers understand what the document was. Um, we, we fast forward to 1450, and the printing press is developed. Once the printing press is developed, they standardize these colophons and they create these title pages. Um, a lot of times publishers would have a pre-designated title page that had their logo on it. And eventually that title page got separated from the logo. And we use the term colophon to represent the logo from the publisher or the little emblem or stamp that they'll put on the spine or keep it on the title page of the book. That happened about 50 years after the printing press was developed. And fast forward to now when Joseph Smith is translating the Book of Mormon, he happens to include a colophon written by Nephi, and this was in 1829, but obviously he didn't use an emblem. He used the ancient Egyptian form of a colophon, which happens to be one of the major influences of the language that the Book of Mormon was written in. If you go back and reference the video I did on verse 2 of the Book of Mormon, you can learn a little bit more about Egyptian writing styles and the influence it had on Lehi and Nephi, but suffice it to say that Egyptian writing was a major influence in what ended up being the language of the Nephites and the Lamanites in the Book of Mormon. And that is right on par with everything that we found in the last hundred years about the time period in which Lehi and Nephi lived in the land of Jerusalem. Now, in 1952, it was finally discovered that First Nephi, Jacob, Enos, and Mormon all had this literary device. Now, this is 133 years after the Book of Mormon was translated. Hugh Nibley finally recognizes these literary elements. Now, was it just a happenstance that Joseph Smith happened to include colophons as he tried to deceive the world by writing the Book of Mormon? without understanding what a colophon was, then not pointing out the colophons to anyone, no one discovering the colophons for over a hundred years. And then as 
better understanding of Egyptian literary devices became available, Hugh Nibley puts two and two together and notices this incredible proof of the authenticity of the Book of Mormon. Now, one of the things that Hugh Nibley uses in his case for authenticity of the colophons used in the Book of Mormon is this Bremerine papyrus uh, from 305 BC. Now, when I pulled up the Bremerine papyrus, I immediately recognized these symbols. And again, if you go back and watch my video on verse 2, you'll see some of the characters from the so-called Anton manuscript, the character manuscript that we have of some of the pictures of the characters that were being translated. And if you can look there, and then you look over at the Bremer Rind, and you can see how this is a very similar language, a reformed Egyptian, if you will, as the Bremer Rind was written in Egyptian. So well, we have the Bremer Rind papyrus from 305 BC on the left. We have the Anton manuscript, just so we can see the characters and the similarity between the characters in the second column and on the third column over on the right we have the actual printer's manuscript of what oliver cowdery and joseph smith actually wrote during the translation process of the small plates we can now translate the bermarine papyrus and what we see is in his colophon he starts out by giving the date number two the titles of himself as the author Three, the names of his parents and a word in praise of their virtues with special mention of his father's prophetic calling. And four, a curse against anyone who might take the book away. Now we compare that with Nephi's colophon. He mentions one, his name, two, the merits of his parents with special attention to the learning of his father, a solemn avowal that the record is true and the assertion I make it with my own hand, and an indispensable condition of every true colophon, since the purpose of the colophon is to establish the identity of the actual writer, not merely the ultimate writer of the text. So this was a big deal of the colophon was to make sure everybody knew who was writing this and putting their stamp or testimony or witness of the truthfulness of the document. This is this was almost a step by step copy of the format used in the Bermaram Papyrus in the Book of Nephi. Uh, the Burma Ram Papyrus was written after the Book of Nephi, about 300 years, but comes from the same region uh, with a similar background and learning and uses the same format in the colophon. The colophon here, again, comes at the beginning in the Burma Ram Papyrus as well as in Nephi. Keep in mind the Burma Rind Papyrus wasn't discovered until 1864. That's 45 years after Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. So if you think that Joseph Smith found the Bermoran papyrus, found a translation of it, recognized the pattern used in the colophon, duplicated that in the Book of Nephi, dates don't match up for that. The translation happened far before we discovered the Bermoran papyrus. That's not enough for you. I just want to throw one other idea out there about this. The Bremer Ryan Papyrus shows us that colophons often came at the beginning of a text. But as you study and research more about colophons, you'll see that probably more than half of the colophons come at the end of the text. Now, Jacob, we'll get to it, but Jacob uses a colophon at the end of his text, which is another testament that what Nephi said of their ancient Egyptian background was authentic and true. And this very well could be the beginning of the book of Nephi that Nephi chooses to start with a colophon but I do want people to remember this is what Nephi wrote. Nephi wrote the introduction to the book of Mormon to the first book of Nephi. He wrote an account of Lehi and his wife Sariah and his four sons being called Laman, Lemuel, Sam, and Nephi. He wrote it in the third person and then he ends with a mini colophon in the introduction and this is according to the account of Nephi, or in other words, I, Nephi, wrote this record. Now, the red part was not written by Nephi. The red part was introduced later uh, under the influence of James E. Talmadge. So that gave us a separation where often we don't even read the first part of what Nephi wrote. We skip straight to verse 1, and we read, I, Nephi, have been born of goodly parents. Therefore, I was taught somewhat in learning about my father. And we see these first three verses, and it's a perfect colophon. He said he started the book with a colophon. But is it possible that maybe he ended his introduction with the colophon? 
this gap in the text was made by Oliver Cowdery, not by Nephi himself. If you look back at the printer's manuscript, you'll see that the text is one continuous thing from the very beginning. There's no break in what we see now as chapter one and the introduction. So is it possible that this was all the introduction and Nephi was ending in even a more traditional way, his introduction with the colophon? Because look now, as we'll look forward to verse four in the next video, but look at the end of verse three, and now I know that the record which I make is true, and I make it with my own hand, and I make it according to my knowledge, in perfect accordance with colophon format. And then he starts off in verse four, for it came to pass that in the commencement of the first year of the reign of the judges. To me, it almost looks like that's where he's starting his book. And verses one through three that we know now is really the end of the introduction, which is even more in line with what we know from Egyptian colophons that the majority ended ended a thought, ended a passage, or ended a chapter or a book. Either way, whether the colophon is at the beginning of the book of Nephi or at the end of the introduction, it is right on par with everything we know about ancient Egyptian writing and the format is step-by-step step a perfect match for the time period and the language in which Nephi claims to have lived and be speaking. And it is a format that was known by little to no person in the Western Hemisphere in the year 1829. This format wasn't understood by scholars until nearly a hundred years later.